Welcome everybody and we are going to be covering the topic of the keto diet tonight. So the, the whole purpose in going through this, who in here has seen stuff in the media about the keto diet here recently? Pretty much everybody, it's like everywhere. And um, so I want to go through kind of the, the fab part of it and what's fact, you know, because of course with any new trend, you know, there's there's obviously something there that, that got it moving and, and going in a direction. but then there's all kinds of uh, marketing tactics that get into it also, and it starts to take the truth and stretch it a little bit, right? You know, just uh, because everybody's selling something, you know, so they're going to try to uh, make it seem like things are a little bit more fantastic than they actually are. Congratulations, by the way. You did a marathon yesterday. Everybody give her a hand. <laughs> and she made it here without dying, so if you hear any groans right in front of the camera, that's why. Um, Curtain time was pretty decent too. Yeah, that's very good. Thank Excellent. You. Um, okay, so we're covering health fad, fraud, or sustainable diet plan. Really, to fish through all this stuff and and see what is what is truth, what is not. Okay, and what what you can do to kind of uh, tune into this stuff. So the irony behind all this is that the keto diet was actually brought about in around the 1920s. So it's been around for a long time, you know. But uh, of course, it started uh, with you know, a lot of the, the major application for it came when they started realizing that they could use it to reduce the frequency of seizures in, in kids. So uh, they, they basically wanted to mimic what happens when you go into a fasting state. And so they, uh, <coughs> pardon me, they found that this was very effective in that mechanism. But, you know, since then they've also found, hey, this is great for losing weight. You know, so that's when all the marketing spin started really uh, taking its course. So let's start with ketosis defined, okay? Uh, ketosis is a metabolic state in which some of the body's energy supply comes from ketone bodies in the blood. In contrast to a state of gly uh, glycolysis in which blood glucose provides energy, ketosis is a result of metabolizing fat to provide energy. That's, of course, just the basic Wikipedia definition. So typically... For most people, uh, we burn fat for, or we burn sugar for energy because it's everywhere. Okay, we get it. All the processed foods, all the carbs, all the the breads and rice and potatoes and everything else. They even excess meat. You know that breaks down into simple sugars, and so your body just becomes accustomed to burning these uh, for, <coughs> pardon me, for energy. But ketosis is characterized by serum concentrations of ketone bodies over 0.5 millimoles with low and stable levels of insulin and blood glucose. Nutritional ketosis is typically in the range from 0.5 to 3. Ketone bodies acetoacetate and B-hydroxybutyrate are formed when liver glycogen stores are depleted. So the liver uh, forms glycogen, which is stored in the muscles, and then that's actually broken down for energy when you're burning carbs. Okay, so the idea with ketosis is that you get out of that state where you're, you're burning uh, glycogen stores and your body starts running off of ketones instead, which is from fat, uh, fat metabolism. Okay, so ketoacidosis is where serum concentrations are over 15. Okay, so contrast that here. 0.5 to 3 is nutritional ketosis. Okay, a lot of uh, doctors still try to scare people off of doing this diet, which is, you know, which is crazy, honestly, because it's like, you know, at the same time we're prescribing medications, but hey, they're no problem at all. You know, but beware of this because, you know, if you get over 15, which is a long distance from three, then, you know, hey, that's a, that's ketoacidosis and that's a problem. And it is, but, you know, they're nowhere in the same ballpark, okay? So this is differentiated as an acute life-threatening state. Diabetic <laughs> ketoacidosis results from a shortage of insulin and can lead to diabetic coma if left untreated. Alcoholic ketoacidosis occurs more frequently in alcoholics with liver or pancreatic conditions. So they're alcoholics, but they have existing liver and pancreatic conditions also. So those two things come together, and you end up having a problem. But these things are, they're still not common. 
you know, it's not something you run into all the time. So signs of ketoacidosis include thirst, frequent urination, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, shortness of breath, weakness, fatigue, confusion. If these signs are seen, then definitely you should see a doctor. You know, but most people are not going to be in this in this uh, in this vicinity, right? And there's a special ways to get around it as well as we'll talk about. So in terms of safety, some doctors regard complete elimination of carbs as unhealthy and dangerous. But, you know, your, your medications are fine. Don't worry, just stay away from the diet stuff. Uh, but for most otherwise healthy patients, it is unlikely to have serious side effects. Although patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes are cautioned from following a strict carb-free diet, uh, also if you have gallbladder issues, pancreatitis, kidney disease, liver disease, which basically all these things have to do with metabolism. You're not metabolizing food properly. So, of course, you know, have a little bit of caution, move into it slowly. That's kind of what we're getting at here. Or have had any form of intestinal tract surgery. If you've had gastric bypass, colon, uh, colonectomy, any of these things that have removed a portion of your digestive system, well, then naturally you're going to be more uh, more likely to experience problems as well, right? Okay, so then you have to be very cautious in your approach, but that doesn't mean that you can't follow a ketogenic diet. Yes? That would include gallbladder removal too, right? Uh, gallbladder removal, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely a gallbladder issue. Yeah, so uh, because, of course, when you don't have a gallbladder, you don't have the bile salts, you don't digest fat properly, and that just cascades down, down the line. Um, not too many people are going to, you're not going to run into too many people that have had their pancreas or uh, kidneys or liver removed necessarily. Not as many as gallbladders, but hey, that's an expendable organ, right? You know, you can have your gallbladder removed, no problem. Or at least that seems to be the story. Most symptoms of ketosis are the simple transition from the body having to alter its trained method of energy production. Okay, and this is really the big picture here. So the idea is the problems that you have are simply because what? You're used to doing one thing. Your body likes to do what it's always done. And so when you change it, things get messy, right? So that's the same thing if, if you're used to sitting on the couch and you then go to the gym things get messy, right? Things don't agree. They, you know, they don't really run properly because, of course, you're sore and you're not used to it. The same thing happens here. Studies have shown that after the Schwatka imperative period, which is two to four week transition from glucose adaptation to keto adaptation, physical endurance is unaffected so long as the diet is high in nutritional fat. So the studies show that you know, once you get over that period, it's not a problem. You can actually maintain it, no big deal at all, because your body is now used to running on a different fuel. They equate this kind of like, uh, you know, uh, driving a hybrid vehicle. That really your body is, it's designed to burn both things. You can burn fat and you can burn carbs. And that's great because you get different things in different foods. So if you find yourself in a situation, you know, on a deserted island or, you know, buried in the rainforest somewhere, and you only have access to certain kinds of food, well, then your body will adapt to that diet. You know, you can move out of this country and you can move to India. Or you can move to, you know, the, the Australian outback. I mean, you can move to all these different places and you would adapt to that cultural, that culture's diet. And because you're moving out of America, you would naturally lose weight, right? <laughs> uh, so that's, you know, that it's a brilliant mechanism of the body where it's, it's designed to run off of these different fuels. I will contest here, though, and I've talked about this in other uh, other workshops. I think I've talked about it in Bulging Bellies. I know I talked about it in uh, the owner's manual. That even though we call things food, does not actually mean, how's it going, guys? It does not mean that it is food, okay? We in our culture call all kinds of different things food. We call, uh, you know, pork and shellfish and all those things food. But you move to a different community, you move to a different culture, they wouldn't call those things food. You go over to different areas of China and they may call snakes and dogs and, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, bats and, you know, and all kinds of, uh, depending on where you go, they call things food that here we'd be like, oh, are you kidding me? That's not food. The point being is that we have to really define what is food. 
So I, I would encourage you, if you haven't gone back, uh, go back and watch the owner's manual to really get uh, what, what I believe a, a good definition of food is. Um, because if something is, there's a difference between being food and being edible, right? You can eat your pants. That doesn't mean that it's food, right? So, but hey, I'll, in terms of nutritional value, a lot of the things that we eat are not much better than eating your pants. That, that's, that's my point. Okay, so one common symptom of early ketosis is bad breath due to the expiration of acetone, the smell of nail polish remover or paint thinner. So if you run into anybody and, uh, you know, and, and their, their breath smells like one of these things, just say, hey, you're, good, you're going through ketosis, right? <laughs> Probably not a good idea. Uh, so this is due to the breakdown of aceto acetic acid into acetone and carbon dioxide. So it smells like it because it literally is. They're, they're breathing nail polish remover. Okay? So, uh, but, you know, these symptoms tend to go away. They, you know, they, once, again, your body balances it out, all these things will, will tend to pass as you move forward through this, uh, this transition period. Okay? Here's the transition signs. Number one, probably the biggest one everybody is interested in, weight loss. When carbs are abundant, there is no reason to burn fat, right? That, that's the whole idea. And this, this has not changed, and we've been talking about this for 10 years. You know that as long as you're eating carbs, your body has no reason to go after the fat stores that it has there. So, you know, in, in men, it tends to be in the belly. In women, it tends to be around the backside. You know, and it just, it will stay there because your body doesn't need it. So it's actually an intelligent mechanism, though, Uh uh, big fat lie, I believe, we, we, we talked about this fact that what our understanding of weight gain is, is incredibly skewed. You know, that we get this idea that you just gain weight because, you know, and you put fat on the body because you're overeating. But that's not really true. The, what, what the current science is looking at is the fact that weight gain is actually an immune system function, that that the ability to put on adipose tissue is a protective mechanism. That when your body uh, is getting a lot, of, when you're getting a lot of uh, toxins into your system, toxins like to go to fat. Okay, so fat basically think about adipose tissue as a fat storage vessel. It's, it's you know it's it's nice neat little containers that naturally are set apart from the internal organs. So your body will pack away the toxins that it can't get rid of into the external fats to keep it away from your heart and your liver and your kidneys and all these organs that are actually serving a real purpose, right? So some people have a really uh, you know, easy time not putting on weight because their bodies can easily excrete toxins. For what reason? Who knows? You know, everybody's genetics are just a little bit different. So some people just sweat it out, you know, whatever it is, they just get rid of it easily. Either higher kidney function, higher liver function, you know, who knows? We don't, we don't understand all this stuff. Other people, they don't have an easy enough time. Uh, maybe it comes down to gut dysfunction, which is related to, in a lot of times, to vaccinations. You know, I mean, it could be a lot of different things. Uh, maybe it was chemical exposures as a kid. Who knows? But one way or another, they have an issue with getting rid of those toxins. So the adipose tissue is a mechanism of that, that their body will put it away to keep it, uh, keep it out of, you know, in, in uh, a separate area away from those, those vital organs, including your brain, okay? So one thing that you always have to look at when you're looking at, get, at losing weight no matter what is that you're not just burning the fat, but you're also detoxifying at the same time. You have to... You have to enable the detoxification pathways because if you don't, when you're dumping fat, you're dumping toxins, right? They have to be able to go somewhere. And if your body couldn't get rid of them back when it put the fat on, what's going to help it now? So you've got to change some aspect of that in, in terms of detoxification as well. So now that you guys all read this behind my head while I was talking, when carbs are abundant, there's no reason to burn fat. When carbs are not, and the body starts burning fat for energy, fat cells are an obvious and easy source, right? They, it's already there. It's like your body, as long as you're putting the carbs in your mouth, your body is going to go after what it's already used to, right? You know, you're, as long as your favorite restaurant is down the street, 
you don't think about it. You ju- you just go there. But the minute that it's gone now, oh, wait a second. You know, now I have to go and I have to find somewhere else to eat. Right? You know, so it's it's that same mechanism. Your body wants to burn the same things. Until you make it change and adapt, it won't. It will even put you into a starvation mode, leaving all that there for energy, you know, for a later time until it is exhausted and starving from not having the supply of the rest. So uh, those that half it with diet and, uh, you know, and do well for six days and then have a cheat day where they just do everything wrong, that's actually a bad thing because what you're doing is you're training your body to wait those six days and then, you know, and then uh, selectively burn on that seventh day. So what happens as a result of that is your body will put more energy away when it comes so that you'll have it there to burn later. You, you're, you're training your body the wrong way. So that, you know, this diet is really something that has to be a lifestyle like any diet. It can't be something that you just do when it feels comfortable. Does that make sense? You know, that's why typically diets don't work. Diets don't work. Lifestyles work. That's the big picture. Okay, number two, appetite regulation. Regular overconsumption of carbs leads to suppressed response to hormones controlling hunger. This is exactly what I was just talking about. So removing them can restore sensitivity. You've got to break the pattern of the hormones that that your body is controlled by. You know, the, the nervous system uses the hormones to regulate all this stuff. And until you break that cycle, the body won't convert over and start to produce hormones and, and, and activate the way that it's supposed to, to to start going after the fat stores. Number three, increase energy. Carbs cause up and down spikes. While in ketosis, your body supplies lots of ready fuel for your brain. So, you know, your typical carb loading, you, you load up on the carbs and then you, you crash in the afternoon and then you reload again and then you crash. And it's just this up and down where, you know, now we're supplementing with coffee, you know, and caffeine and Red Bulls and everything else to try and pull us through those carb dips, you know, in the afternoon and all that, all the five-hour energy shots and everything else, where when you get into this state, fat is slow burning. It doesn't burn rapidly. You're, you're, you're talking about, a, you know, it's burning more like a candle instead of a, a beer can exploding on a bonfire, right? You know, they're just, it's, it's just a different release of energy. So number four, fatigue diminishes. Early in your energy, uh, your energy tanks as your body searches for glucose. So your energy crashes, your body is looking for all the glucose, but it's not there. So you just feel tired because again, it's going into that, okay, I'm going to suppress down and I'm going to wait for the carbs, right? So you're going to feel, you're going to feel down because your body is waiting. It's saying, eventually you're going to give it to me. Eventually it's coming in. (coughs) One of these days it's coming in. And until you get over that and figures out, hey, it's not coming, your body won't convert over to that fat burning mechanism. Okay? Uh, but once it makes that switch, fatigue goes away. Because as soon as it makes that switch and says, okay, we need a different uh, fuel source, it's like a hybrid car. It goes from the gasoline over to the electric, and boom, it's just immediate. All of a sudden, you've got fat there to burn. Right, and so you'll see the pounds start dropping off immediately once you hit that point. Stool changes uh, through the transition to a high-fat, low-carb diet. You may experience visitations from Thing, Flo, or one of the other characters from Bulging Bellies. You guys remember those? Okay. If not, go back and watch that uh, entertaining spot. Once your organs regulate the new to the new intake, normal will return. Okay, so you'll get back to what everything should be, but you've got to get through that transition point first, okay? Uh, Palatable breath. As discussed before, uh, breathing nail polish is common, but should return to normal after transition. Number seven, devices like the Keto Mojo, uh, thank you, Lisa, for for pointing me to that one, can be purchased to measure your blood ketone and glucose levels. Have you found it's uh, worked pretty well so far? Oh, yes. Yes? Yes. Okay, so... Keto Mojo, you know, it's one of the devices that's out there, and you know, the, the price isn't bad. It's like what a dollar a test. 
the device hard. itself, it tests both ketose and glucose. So the device itself is fifty dollars, and then the keto strips are like a dollar a test, which is like a third or a fifth of what they normally are because they're usually anywhere from three to five dollars a strip. Okay. Yeah. And now I did, for the record, I did read a couple of reviews, you know, and some people say they question the reliability of, you know, the accuracy of the readings. But as long as you get into a general range, you know, you kind of know what's going on, you know, and that's re really what you're looking for. <clears throat> One of the other things that they say is because it only reads, uh, you know, most of these devices, they only read one of those two uh, that it doesn't look at the, the, the booty rate one. It only looks at the other one that, you know, you're not really necessarily getting a true measure. But you know what? These people are just picky. You know, it's like it, the, we know what we're looking for. We're looking for those levels to rise. And as long as you know that that level is coming up into that range, you know you're there. And you're going to feel it anyways. And you're going to smell it anyways, right? You, you know when your breath smells like paint thinner. Okay. Well, maybe you don't. But just ask a friend, right? All right. Keto diet options. A strict keto diet typically recommends in the range of 60 to 80 percent of daily calories from fat. Okay, 60 to 80, 15 to 25 percent calories from protein, and only 5 to 10 percent of calories from carbs. So very, very small, small amount of carbs. Um, you know, and then you talk to other you know groups, and they'd of course say, you know, you get no carbs, like nothing, not not nothing at all. You know, if you eat that, you're you, you know, you're you're gonna mess up the entire thing. You know, you you'll get a range of opinions in anything you do, right? You know, but the general rule is basically, you know, that that that's what you're gonna be about five to ten percent of calories and carbs, and that's about it. It's a difficult task, though, to get eighty percent of your calories, eighty percent of your calories from olive oil, coconut oil, palm oil, avocados, chia seeds, flax seeds, bone broth, and butter. I mean, what can you do with that, right? It's pretty, you know, anybody want to just eat a giant spoonful of coconut oil, you know, for breakfast? You know, it just frozen. Ooh, it's like coconut oil ice cream, you know, uh, or, or a giant stick of butter. You just take it right out of the package and gnaw on it, right? It doesn't sound real appealing. Um, often in the pursuit of fat, people will overconsume, of course, meat. And then eggs and fish, nuts and dairy. So there, you know, we try to supplement it because how much, how many avocados can you stomach, right? But the problem is the high amount of protein can stall the ketosis progression as your body can convert excess protein to glucose. So you know, you're getting all this protein there, and now you have all those issues. And then of course you get into the what is healthy meat and what is not healthy meat, and and everything else. We're going to cover some of that. So the bottom line is, it's every bit as important the quality of the items that you consume as simply what they are, right? You know, you don't want to uh, eat a giant stick of, I can't believe it's not butter, you know, because, hey, it's butter, right? No, it's not the same thing. You know, that's all trans fats. You know, we talked about that in Bulging Belly. So uh, butter should be grass-fed. It shouldn't be from corn-fed cows, okay? There's going to be a difference in the quality from corn-fed cows to grass-fed cows, all right? As many items as possible should be organic, and fish should be wild-caught, and in my opinion, have both scales and fins. You know, you don't want to just eat catfish or, you know, shark all the time, right? So, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is a, a modified keto diet, okay? So, this is, this is for the, the less strict folk. Uh, so now 40 to 50 percent is from fats and oils. So now you only have to eat one stick of butter a day and three or four or six avocados, right? You know, but you can have a little bit more of the other stuff. 30 percent is from protein and 20 percent now is from carbs. It is reported that reducing carbs, though, to just 30 percent of your calorie intake can still lead to weight loss. Okay, this is important to understand, okay? The problem is most Americans consume well over half of their calories in junk carbs, even if they're organic, right? So, we're, you know, now that we're well into the organic kick, you know, just go and shop through the aisles of, you know, I hate to pick on them, but, you know, just, just for this, the sake of this argument, go to my favorite store, Whole Foods, 
right? Walk through the, the, the aisles and just see how much of that stuff is carbs. What you'll find is it's pretty much everything, right? I mean, there's, unless you go to the perimeter where the meat and the cheese and the, uh, you know, and the, the vegetables and fruits are, all the stuff in the middle, it's all carbs, everything. So you can eat all organic and still be getting 70% of your carbs or of your diet calories as carbs, right? So uh, in this plan, just like any other, it's important that you only consume high quality ingredients. Pork isn't good for keto. Okay, you know, you guys remember the Atkins diet, you know, and the big thing was that with that is like you can eat all the bacon that you want. You know, you can bake, 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 and you know, eat that all. No, that was a dog commercial, wasn't it? <laughs> Sausages or something like that. Um, I did think of the Atkins as very much the thought of keto diet. They're thinking high protein, high fat, no carb. Mm -hmm. But it's a it's a very different version of this. Yeah. And of course, you know, that, that, that it, it was very much like that. Like, it, it was very much into, you know, you can eat all the pork you want. All the meat and all the But, you know, there's a lot more to worry about than just the fat ratio, as you'll learn in the workshop, the owner's manual, and again, in Bulging Bellies, I keep going back to those ones because, we you know, we talked about a lot of this stuff. You know, so, uh, yeah, you might be able to lose a few pounds, but you gain, a, you know, a few worms, too. So... You know, you you got to look at these things. You know, and it's it's uh, it's important mostly to know where the ingredients are, what is good clean food, and what's not. So, but you know, at least this this is a little bit more palatable, right? You know, this is a little bit more doable. Okay, so for years now, we've promoted a practically unchanged diet. Um, I don't know when. You know, I, I mean, it was probably eight, ten years ago. You know, that we basically formulated th this plan. Here are the fundamentals of the advanced diet recommended for those trying to lose weight or recovering from chronic illness. And all of you guys, you should already have a copy of this. If you don't, uh, we can, of course, get you a copy of this. There's the advanced diet and there's a the core diet. So the advanced diet has always been promoted as if you're, you know, if you're recovering from chronic disease like, you know, cancer, blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, you know, heart attack, stroke you know, or, or uh, significantly overweight, this would be to get you back to normal, okay? This is what you do to get back to health. Then the core diet, this is just what we do. This is just lifestyle. This is just normal diet on every day. You know, when people ask, how do I eat? Well, here, this is, this is what we do. It's just normal. Like, it's not a diet plan. It's just, it's just a lifestyle plan. So if, uh, you know, if you don't want a paper version, it's also on our website. You can just look up the diets on the website as well. But it's, it's been pretty much unchanged. There's been little tiny tweaks over that time. But the funny thing is diet really never changes. You know, we, you know, name the diets that have come across. You know, you got the, the Atkins and you had the South Beach diet and now the keto diet. And, you know, what other ones am I missing? I mean, there's been there's Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers. You know. it's, it's like there's all these different diet plans. But ultimately, you realize that all the core is all the same. It's just reasons change you know the, the reasons for doing these certain things change and tweak just a little bit and some people find excuses for eating things you know for one reason usually because they like it and they don't want to give it up so they'll find reasons that fit that picture you know so oh now you can eat all the bacon you want to because of this you know and skip over all that other information because it really doesn't matter you know but ultimately most of it is really still packaged the same way which is kind of uh not ironic so here's a, here's the basics. If you're trying to recover from chronic illness, it's real simple. You can I mean you can literally fit it right here. No sugar, grains, alcohol, fruits, starchy vegetables, soy, corn, artificial sweeteners. I hate to have to put any fruits at all or any vegetables into that category, but the point is is anything that converts to sugar. Okay, you're restricting for the purposes of the diet. Okay? So no, fruit is not in the same category as alcohol. You know, don't, don't, don't mess that up in your head and think, you know, we're saying fruits are bad for you. They're not. They're fantastic for you. But it's for the purpose of this. Uh, alcohol is not. Artificial sweeteners are not. Okay, next one. No pork, shrimp, shellfish, catfish, squid, dog, cat, horse, snake, or other animal unfit for human consumption. Again, read the, you know, watch the owner's manual workshop if you have questions about any of that. Uh, Latin national, no veal, it's just cruel. 
you know, tying tying baby cows to a to a, a two foot steel post and you know tied to a chain so they can't move their entire life. And that's it's just cruel. So who cares if it tastes good? It, it's think of organic beans and grass fed organic dairy. It doesn't mean you can't have it. Just limit it. Okay, healthy meats such as grass finished organic beef, bison, venison, free roaming chicken and eggs. Wild poultry such as turkey, pheasant, duck, and wild caught Alaskan salmon and other fish that have both scales and fins should be limited to no more than 25% of the total food intake. Okay, no more than 25%. It's still within the range where you're going to be able to hit that, that keto diet, right? Because you're not over consuming your meats. And that's a, a problem a lot of people have. You know, they just eat massive, you know, they're eating a pound of grass fed beef because it's grass fed good for me you know and no beef is not bad for you either you know there's a lot of bad press about eating meat when all of them and I've talked about this I don't know how many times on various workshops they're always looking at corn fed animals when they do the studies on beef you understand that name one study where they're actually looking at grass fed cows no they're always studying people who are eating corn-fed beef because that was basically all there was. You know, but we should be re-researching, and it will, it will happen, where they're gonna start looking at people that eat grass-fed only versus corn only, and they will find a difference because the fatty acid ratio is radically different. A, a grass-fed cow, not ironically, is a perfect four to one omega-3 to six ratio, whereas, a corn-fed cow is more like 30 to 1. 4 to 1, 30 to 1. Where should your body be? 4 to 1. Where are most Americans? 30 to 1. You are what you eat, right? So uh, there is a difference, and it will come out in the research, but you know, probably not anytime soon. All these things are predictable. It's funny. That's, that's the thing about research is predictable. You always know it's going to come up. They just don't know it's going to come up yet. You know, and it's like, it's not proof until it's in the research. No, proof makes evident in the research, but it was proof all along, right? The other 75% should consist mostly of greens and vegetables, oils, nuts, and seeds. What does that sound like? Keto diet. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 man, what does it sound like? South Beach diet. I mean, it just, it's, it's, it's all the same. Uh, eat three reasonable meals a day and limit snacks in between meals and especially after dinner. It's that simple. You know, and as long as you stick to this stuff, you hit that basically keto state where your body is burning both fat and carbs. It can burn both and it should be able to easily transition to both. But when you give it ample reason not to have to ever burn fat because there's so much sugar that your body can never burn at all. Well, then it's going to go the easy route. It's just, and it's just easy to burn carbs. They're quick, efficient fuel. It's like rocket fuel, right? It just goes. All right. Uh, the core diet recommends for everyday lifestyle and is slightly modified to be a little bit more flexible. So no soy except organic tempeh, uh, tempeh or miso, corn unless it's organic heirloom, and no artificial sweetener still. You limit your sugar, your grains, your alcohol, and starchy vegetables. You stay away from packaged and processed edibles. Notice I'm not saying food there because a lot of this, you know, cardboard inside of a cardboard box is still not food. Okay, still no pork, shrimp, shellfish, catfish, squid, dog, cat, horse, snake, or other animal unfit for human consumption. We'll make sure that one's clear. And no veal, it's still cool. Fruits may get, be consumed in reasonable amounts, preferring organic. Uh, again, fruit is great for you, and I have no issues with it whatsoever. As long as it's you know it's ripe and it's organic, it's it's fantastic. Limited intake of organic beans and grass-fed organic dairy still, uh, but you can still have it perfectly fine. Healthy meats such as uh, that same list of everything still twenty five percent. You know, and the, the only real issue is here is you're allowing a little bit more carbs into the diet. You're allowing something else there. But for the most part, doesn't that still look like the original advanced keto diet? I mean, it's basically still the same sliver. So lots of healthy greens and vegetables, oils, nuts, and seeds. Eat three reasonable meals a day and limit snacks in between meals and especially after dinner. The same diet, 
that's, that's been there for 10 years. You know, so if you guys, who in here has done the advanced side in the past? Okay. And is it incredibly difficult to maintain? Not really. You know, and then once you switch to the core dial, like I said, I mean, we don't even think about it. It's just, it's just diet. Like you don't even, you, you don't consider it. And it, it means, you know, you can occasionally go and get a piece of cheesecake somewhere, you know, whatever it is. You can cheat a little bit, uh, but you don't, you know, you don't cheat every day in abundance. That's, that's the big, the big point there. Okay. Ketone intake. Exogenous ketone supplements are gaining a lot of popularity recently, okay? Especially multi-level marketing companies, of course. Uh, Prove It is one of them. Uh, played a role in popularizing exogenous, exogenous ketones, as MLM companies often do, taking a new product to market as revolutionary and letting people build businesses out of it, right? You see this happen all the time. What you get is lots and lots of very expensive hype. So I'm sorry if anybody sells, you know, this particular brand, you know, or any other brand of multi-level marketing. But you know, this, this is it's just it's just marketing. You know, this this is this is how it works. You know, I didn't write the rules on this stuff. I'm just reporting it. Exogenous ketones are not a fat burn formula. They don't allow you to eat all the donuts you want to and still lose weight. It's not the magic pill that allows you to, you know, do whatever you want, eat Taco Bell and everything else, and yet you you drink a cup and magically your your brain is in this uh, extreme state where you can, you know, read through books in two minutes and <laughs> still have time for, you know, everything else. You know, it's, it's all of this stuff is ridiculous. You know, when they start getting into these kind of claims, so just drinking ketones does not make you lose weight. That's the bottom line. It does not make you lose weight. Now, does that by application? Yes, but you have to be in the right set of circumstances. So here are those circumstances. Number one, you must cut your carb intake because as long as carbs are available to burn, they will, right? If you just start right now and you, and you just, you know, your, your diet is an average American diet and you just start drinking exogenous ketones, sure, your body may burn that, but the, but the real thing is why does it need to? Because it's already used to burning the carbs. That's easy. So it's just going to keep on burning the carbs because there's no reason to go for anything else. So you, all those expensive exogenous ketones that you're taking are probably going straight through you or at least a good portion of them. So why bother, right? Uh, number two Understand your body must go into ketosis itself and learn to burn fat for fuel. You know, there's no shortcut here. It has to make that transition on its own because it's the one, you know, it's the thing doing all the work. So every time you supply the body exogenously with fuel, okay, you stunt the need to find fuel, right? We just think about it. If, if you know, you're, you're working and going into ketosis, but now, you, you know, you get to ketosis, you're there, your body is now ready to start burning ketones and start using them for fuel, but you start every meal, oh, oh, you know, you're taking shots of exogenous ketones all the time. Well, it's like, okay, well, there's your fuel. You don't need it from anywhere else, right? So why burn fat? Why have to burn fat? Take away those energy stores, convert it to ketones that can now be used when they're going straight down your throat. So you 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 know you 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 have to get there first. So if you don't, the fat stays put. You stay right where you are, nothing changes. Okay? Number three, exogenous ketone supplements, therefore, should be used as needed and randomly to give you a boost when it's most needed. Make sense? So if you don't require that additional boost, then don't stunt the process. You have to look at it that way to where it's not something that you just do on a very regimented, very scheduled basis. You know, it's not like every breakfast, you know, every day for breakfast, I do this every day, you know, and then I do another shot at two o'clock in the afternoon. If you do that, how quickly do you think your body is going to learn that schedule? I mean, you're not working with a dummy here, right? Your body is much more intelligent than anyone in this room. You are much dumber than your body is. I am much dumber than my body is. The smartest doctors on the planet have nothing 
compare to the innate wisdom inside of an infant. I mean, it's, it's nowhere in the same ballpark. So we don't want to stunt that process. We only want to supplement when you really need it. You know, if you're just, you're going through that initial transition and you're just breaking in and, and it's like, you know, I've got a long day. I didn't sleep well. You know, I, I really just need a quick boost instead of going after coffee or, you know, or, um, uh, you know, five hour energy or something like that, you know, some, some carbs to get you going, you take a, a drink of the exogenous ketones and it pulls you through, but then you get back on track, letting your body do this, do its thing. Does that make sense? Okay. So, you know, you, you've got to watch when you look at all these supplements that they say, you know, take, you know, take one ounce, uh, you know, three times a day or something like that. All that is to do what? Sell more. It's to sell more. Yeah. It's the same thing with vitamins. You know, we sell a lot of vitamins, right? But if, if I've ever gone through vitamins with, with you, you've probably seen, I almost never tell you to take what's on the bottle. It's almost always half of what's on the bottle because you actually only need about half of what's on the bottle. The reality is supplement companies put higher amounts and expiration dates, right? to make sure that you go through them quicker. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's like if something expires, you gotta get rid of it and you gotta get more from who? The supplement company. You know, but most of the time, it's perfectly fine. In fact, I have, I have patients at work uh, that, that did work for a supplement company and she's like, oh my gosh, you know, the, the, the actual expiration date is usually twice what it is on the bottles. Like, you really can't pay attention to that, but we have to, you know, it's uh, by law we have to. So, the verdict is exogenous ketones are not the no effort fat burner that many sell them to be. So if, and if somebody starts talking the hype or you, you know, you, you're watching TV and they're talking all about this stuff and everybody's thinking, oh man, I can feel it already. You know, all this, no, I'm sorry. That's, that's just not how it works. You don't just take one and, and immediately notice a difference. Okay. All right. So, uh, it's not marijuana. It's not. <laughs> I, I would say true that, but I, honestly, Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, so Designs for Health Keto Nootropic is a, is a clean, high-quality exogenous ketone supplement for those correctly following a ketone diet. Okay? We, I understand completely that there are people that are going to be on a keto on a keto diet maybe some of you already are maybe some people that are watching already are you know and so the idea of having something for that quick boost yeah it's a good idea i just want to make sure you're doing it right you know if you're taking some of these you know other multi-level products where you're going through 150 dollars of you know product a month you know it's probably not getting you where you want to go as quickly as you want to go because you're putting in so much artificial fuel uh, not to mention the other ingredients in there. Who knows what's in most stuff? You know, you can go and get, uh, you can probably go and get keto uh, supplements that are full of um, aspartame or, you know, who knows what else. And some of them probably have sugar in them too, you know, because something's got to make it taste good, right? So why nootropics? Nootropics are regarded as smart drugs for their ability to improve cognitive function particularly executive functions, memory, creativity, or motivation in healthy individuals. The keto nootropic uh, combines beta hydroxybutyrate salts with American ginseng to further support cognitive function, sharp focus, and mental acuity without any artificial sweeteners or ingredients. Um, so on that note, you know, there, there are different studies that you look at that, you know, will say that, you know, ginseng doesn't really have all the effects that some people say that it does. But at the same time, you realize, I mean, it's been used for those purposes for, what, thousands of years? And, you know, either, uh, you know, a ton of people are just duped or they just haven't looked at the right thing in the research, you know. So I do believe, you know, having these different uh, time-tested herbs in different formulations is perfectly fine and there's nothing negative about taking ginseng in your diet you know I and mean, it's not like there's there's all these uh, bad counter uh, uh, side effects from taking so this is a good option if you are wanting a supplement to get you through you know at least it's clean you know but mind you again even though we sell this stuff it's not for everybody okay 
I, I want to make it clear just because it's on the shelf, you know, that, that you don't just buy, oh, ketones, you know, and you know, I saw that on the news this morning and you go home and you're making yourself a shake, right? <laughs> you know, and, or, or dumping it in your fruit smoothie because, again, we have to have the right application for this. Putting it, of course, in a, in a fruit smoothie defeats the entire purpose <laughs> because clearly you're not on the, on the right diet plan. So, uh, nonetheless, it, it, the, the ketones used to taste terrible. Uh, basically a big glass full of salt because they're ketone salts, right? So they didn't taste good, but they have made advancements in this area. So uh, we did not do a raffle per se tonight like we have in previous workshops because tonight we decided everybody wins. So uh, you guys all get to, they got you all samples of it. You can, uh, you can all take a glass and uh, you know, buzz your head off and you're going to go home and write symphonies and stuff because of this magical yes. formula. By the way, you're probably all going to lose 50 pounds, except for you. You ran a marathon yesterday, your 50 is gone, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, all those magical things that you've been, uh, that you've been watching on TV, they're all going to happen tonight. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. That's going to be wonderful. And of course, if you have any questions, I'm open for them as long as they're uh, truthful, unlike that last statement. <laughs> <laughs> yes? The ketone diet, is there any difference in how it seems to affect men versus women? Uh, that I don't know. Well, I do know one. Men lose more around the belly, women lose more around the butt. That's not really a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. Yeah, I don't really know if it makes much of a much of, much of a difference beyond that. I would I would think I doubt it because honestly, outside of that, I mean, our physiology is pretty well identical. Any other questions? Um, I remember LeBron James and his back did something similar to that dive, but uh, he didn't stick with it because he stated that he lost some of his explosiveness in the basketball court. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and, and, and stuff like that is, is tough to really gain the full consideration of what, you know, what exactly they were doing, you know, because on the other hand, I know, uh, and I'm not necessarily a promoter of a vegan diet, right? Yet I know that there are UFC fighters that follow a vegan diet. Now, me as a, you know, person who, you know, enjoys having protein, you know, meat in my diet and know how I feel when I don't get uh, ample amounts of protein in my diet, I can't imagine trying to run away from somebody uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, grappling on the ground if I was, if I was only eating salads every day. I mean, that, that to me is just mind boggling, but I know they do it. You know, and they and they perform. I mean, they're UFC fighters. They're top notch level fighters. So, I think it really just depends on. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the person. It depends on their physiology, and we just don't know all the details of what exactly they're doing. And also, there's that that adjustment period. Just like with the changes, you do get more fatigue, and he might now have got out of the adjustment period. True. He could have been following a modified modified keto diet, or he might have been <laughs> taking. <laughs> That, you know, exogenous ketones. Well, he, had, he, uh, he had dropped a lot of weight, and, but you know, he had did it over the course of the summer. Yeah, he probably did get out of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough, though. I mean, you're talking about somebody at the top end of a professional sport. I mean, that's that's an area of physi physiology that most of us aren't ever going to touch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> True that. Yep. So what are some tips to, like, make up that energy whilst the first couple of weeks? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> obviously make sure you're sleeping plenty you know that that's I would say that would be tip number one because most of us don't I mean that's just a reality is uh, you know I, I know I can sleep more you know and uh, pretty much everybody that I talk to in that room you know they it's all the same thing you know when we go through the questions about sleep almost nobody checks off that they sleep enough uh, so that, that's probably point number one. Um, point number two is you make it go faster. You know, you make it, you make the time pass faster, meaning I would just not cheat at all.
for that transition period. I mean, you know you can make it two weeks without eating any carbs if you really want to and you want to get into that position quicker. Um, so, you know, you, you, you speed up that time by just not, not taking any breaks at all. The more you do it, you know, the more, the more carbs you allow in, the more you're just delaying the inevitable. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like a fever, right? You know, if, if you just let the fever go, it's going to break really quick, you know, six hours, four hours, you know, something like that. It doesn't take long, but we know for a fact in the research, when you take fever reducing medications, you drag it out. You know, you're, you just stay sick longer. Um, outside of that, you know, I, you know, make sure that the fuel that you are taking is clean. You know, make sure that you, you can still take supplements and such. I mean, heck, you could, I, I really don't see any reason why you couldn't drink coffee too. I mean, why, uh, why you couldn't have caffeine in, you just don't want to drink lattes. The, the supplement breakfast for the keto diet is a bulletproof coffee, which is butter, coconut oil, there you coffee. Go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so there you go. I mean, you can, you can still have your caffeine. I would think, I mean, really, honestly, I think those would be the biggest, the biggest tips. And, and uh, xylitol chewing gum. Because that's more fun for everybody. Right? <laughs> Xylitol actually has a lot of parts. Well, okay, not not xylitol. The stevia <laughs> chewing gum. And somebody somebody asked me uh, the, the the question. She's not here tonight, but she asked the question: Can I still have chocolate? But she was like, if I can't still have chocolate, then I don't want anything to do with it. Um, and uh, my answer was yes. There are actually brands that you can get, like the uh, the Lily's chocolate. We I think we still have some. No, we don't have it anymore. Oh, okay. Well, somebody yell at Morgan, we can get it back on. But um, the Lily's chocolate is only stevia sweetened. It has no extra sugar in it at all. Huh? Whole Fruits has it? Okay, good. good. Publix does too. Publix do. And help it. Huh? Carbs. Any carbs? Does it have any carbs? I don't know. I mean, it, I, I think it's just, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty basic. It's literally like cocoa and milk fat and stevia. Uh, my sister actually used that when, when she was going through her therapy. Anything else? Any other questions? Yep. For the ones that's had those surgeries that it was talking about, what do you expect? I mean, you just follow it? Well, like the, you or are you going to see something different for them? You, it, it's one of those things you just, you just, pursue with a little more air of caution. That's it. So, so for example, um, if you don't have a gallbladder, okay, and you increase your fat intake to 50% of your diet, what's going to happen? You don't have a gallbladder to emulsify the extra fat that you're putting through your system. So you're probably going to deal with a lot of flagellants, a lot of indigestion and a lot of flow. Or no, no, Bowie Louie. <laughs> Bowie Louie. That was it. <laughs> Would you go about it slower, like in increments, like slowly add more in those, fat? In those cases, in those I would. I would, I would stick to Not a all lot all. more vegetables and gradually increase your fats. You know, so stick to a lot more salads and, you know, zucchini and squash, you know, uh, root vegetables, and uh, but not potatoes, you know, so, not the high sugary stuff. Cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, oh, all that good stuff. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, really. Same going diabetes. Yeah. 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 Same thing. You know, just just walk in slowly. No. Um, I wouldn't say the same thing for diabetes. I started two weeks ago. I have been I started uh, been diagnosed with the pre-diabetes a year ago. My blood sugars were running 180 to 100, 170 to 180 fasting. I've been on medication since that time, and they finally three months ago upped my dosage to the highest dosage of ectosin. I was still running 130s on my blood sugars. I've been doing this for two weeks. This morning and yesterday morning, they were between 112 and 120. 
and I got went full fledged less than sixty grams of I mean less than twenty grams of carbs a day except for a couple of times when I wasn't realizing what I was eating has many carbs and um, keeping the fats up to about one hundred and sixty grams a day. So, so in your experience, clarify that your mm-hmm. recommendation would be to do to what? go on um, go straight into to go it full fledged. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I haven't seen my blood sugars this low in a very long time. Good. And this is fasting blood sugar still over a hundred, which is not good. Yeah. But they're still much better than what they've been for the past year. There you go. Yeah. So you know, and and that's. Basically, the, you know, saying the same thing is that when you, you know, if, if you're, if you can go into it and you don't see any warning signs, you're fine. You know, just edge in with caution, you know, and if you feel you have to modify it, modify it, you know, but if you can, you don't definitely have Definitely watch your body's reactions because you may need to reduce your medication if you're on it. Yeah. And you may, uh, that, that that's true too, you know, especially someone that's. Uh, really dependent on the medication, you know, uh, insulin. insulin pumps, you know, stuff like that. You, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to end up passing out in your car. So, all right. Any other questions? All right. Fantastic. Well, you guys, uh, help yourself to the counter. Uh, and <laughs> they've already been drinking it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. And if you guys do want a copy of the diet, you know, of course, again, you can get a copy from them if you don't already have it.